On behalf of the ABS team, I'd like to welcome you all to Outlook 2017. We'll be looking at what the future holds for the agriculture, fisheries and forestry sectors um, with a focus on innovation over the next couple of days. Improving productivity um, will be critical to success and that's going to require innovation across supply chains. To help explore some of those themes, we've got a great lineup of domestic and international speakers, including um, bankers and analysts, as well as producers from across the agriculture and fisheries sectors. And importantly, people who are developing and adopting new technologies and practices. What I want to do this morning is a bit of scene setting for that discussion. I'll show why we need to keep innovating and talk a bit about the role of government and the private sector. But first, I'll run through our medium term outlook for commodities, which takes us out to 2021 22. The details will be discussed in the sessions that follow, and, in the, and they're in the Agricultural Commodities publication that you received this morning. Now, our, our forecasts are based on a set of macroeconomic assumptions, so it's useful to run through these quickly as they drive some of the changes we're expecting to see. So we're expecting a slow recovery in world growth over the medium term, um, from 3.1 per cent last year to about 3.5 per cent by 2019. Average GDP growth in OECD countries is assumed to strengthen in 2017 and 2018 before slowing slightly to average 1.7 per cent over the medium term. In the US, we think economic growth will increase in the short term, and in the medium term, we're assuming growth at around 2 per cent. In Europe, persistent high unemployment and public debt are expected to subdue economic growth and we're assuming growth of 1.5 per cent there over the medium term. China is anticipated to remain a driver of world growth. We're assuming that growth will slow to less than 6 per cent over the medium term, but that's still strong enough to drive output in other economies, and it's assumed to support the emerging economies of Asia. Now, there are a number of downside risks to the global outlook, including the possibility of more inward-looking policies, um, if there are changes in policy direction in the US or in Europe after their upcoming elections. In China, uncertainty in the recovery of the housing market uh, as well as financial market volatility are risks. The other main macroeconomic assumption is the exchange rate. So we're assuming the Australian dollar will average 75 cents in 2016-17. That compares to 73 cents last financial year 84 cents in 14-15 and 92 cents in 13-14, so it's come down a long way. Over the medium term, we expect the Australian dollar to average around 74 cents. Our assumptions for the exchange rate are based on a gradual increase in energy prices, sustained demand for Australian bulk commodity exports, and an assumed narrowing of the interest rate differential between Australia and other major economies. So to our projections, we're expecting the value of agricultural production to increase in 2016-17 to about $63.8 billion, compared with $58.9 billion last year. Increases in the volume of crop production on the back of exceptional seasonal conditions have offset falling prices because of abundant world supplies. And for livestock, high prices have offset a fall in the volume of meat production stemming from the herd and flock rebuilding phase the industry is currently in. And that follows four years of high turnoff. With an assumption of return to average seasonal conditions following the very favourable 2016-17, we're expecting the value of agricultural production to fall by 4% in 17-18. And it's expected to remain at about $60 billion in real terms, in the medium term, as gains to production in crops and livestock are offset by lower global prices. We're forecasting a rise in farm export earnings to $47.7 billion in 16-17, compared with $44.7 billion last year. Most of that increase has come from increased crop exports. We expect export earnings in real terms to remain strong at around $46 billion by the end of our projection period. Again, in the medium term, increased production of grains and livestock will be offset by lower prices. So some of the specific commodity movements we expect over the next year are increases in the value of wool, sugar and cotton because of higher export volumes 
and higher prices as will demand firms. Beef export values are expected to increase marginally, reflecting increased production following a period of herd rebuilding. However, we are expecting increased competition in export markets, placing downward pressure on prices there. And the story is similar for lamb. Producers have been rebuilding flocks and exports are expected to increase as production picks up. In the case of wheat, we're forecasting a fall in the value of exports as seasonal conditions return to average and export volumes fall. The farm performance story for 2016-17 is very positive. Broadacre farm cash incomes at the national level are estimated to be the highest for 20 years at $216,000 a farm and they build on already high incomes for the previous two years. Most of the increase in broadacre incomes in 16-17 has been a consequence of higher incomes for grain farms driven by exceptional winter crop production. And much of the increase in broadacre broad incomes in 14-15 and 15-16 was from high beef cattle turnoff and an increase in sale yard prices. Beef industry incomes are expected to plateau this year um, as farmers start to rebuild herds, but they're still expected to remain around double the average for the previous 10 years. For the dairy industry, the income story is not as positive. Nationally, farm cash incomes for dairy farms declined by about 20% in 2015-16, and we project they'll decline by a further 17% this financial year to around 11% below the 10-year average. So despite lower production costs, incomes are projected to decline in New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia as a result of lower average milk prices and an overall reduction in milk production. High broadacre farm cash incomes in 2016-17 are widely geographically dispersed and this was the case last year as well. Many regions are expected to have farm cash incomes more than double the average for the previous decade. So those are the blue areas on the map, most of which are predominantly beef, cattle and sheep producing regions. Regions dominated by grain production also have high farm cash incomes compared to the longer term average. But for many, including those in South Australia and Western Australia, incomes are expected to exceed the historical average by more modest amounts. That's the yellow areas. And there are a few regions where farm cash income in 16-17 is projected to be below the longer term averages. This includes uh, regions in central and western Queensland undertaking substantial rebuilding of cattle herds following several years of dry conditions and high turnoff, and grain growing areas where yields were not high enough to offset lower prices, such as the southeastern wheat belt of Western Australia where frost affected crops. I'm going to move on now to talk about innovation. We've, we've chosen innovation as the theme for the conference because it plays a big role in determining competitiveness on global markets. By creating new markets and opportunities, um, and possibly more importantly, it also helps protect what we've already got. For example, two of the big challenges we're facing are climate variability and change and increased competition in key export markets. Now this figures from some work we've done to isolate the effect of climate conditions on productivity growth. And you can see that wheat yields are highly variable over time, and that's mainly because of seasonal conditions. This makes it difficult to see if we're making progress. We've done some innovative work that shows that we are making headway, and Neil Hughes is going to explain this in detail in the climate session tomorrow, so I'll just touch on it here. But to isolate the effect of climate, we've constructed a measure of the climate's contribution to production, which is the climate effect series here. And the downward trend indicates that the contribution climate makes to production has gradually been declining over time. Now, we don't know if this is a permanent consequence of climate change or just natural variation, but this finding is consistent with other work from CSIRO. And basically, it means that the climate's becoming less favourable for growing wheat in Australia. So when you remove the effect of variation in climate condition from wheat yields, so calculating yields as if we'd had average climate conditions, we get a climate adjusted wheat yield. And from this we can see that underlying wheat yields have improved significantly since the mid 2000s. 
something that we couldn't see in the underlying data. And this is important to know because it means that technological progress is offsetting the effects of deterioration in climate conditions. This includes getting better at managing poor years and making, most, and making the most of good years. And as we'll cover in the farm performance session later today, doing these things well is one of the keys to success. Another challenge is increased competition in export markets. In particular, the technology responsible for past productivity growth here is now becoming accessible in developing countries, allowing them to catch up from a lower productivity base. So while they haven't achieved the absolute level of productivity we have, this, this graph just shows growth rates, not productivity levels, you can see that productivity growth in Brazil and China has been much faster than it has here since about the mid-1990s. Improvements in productivity aren't just about technology though. For example, some of our recent work identified that policy reforms and infrastructure investments by South American beef exporters is likely to boost their competitiveness in some of our key markets. Trish Gleason is going to talk more about that in the meet session tomorrow. So remaining competitive requires continued productivity growth and a big part of that will be through innovation of one kind or another. Now while it's difficult to predict what the next innovations will look like, we can get an idea of the broad changes they'll bring by looking at what's happened so far. And this slide summarises the consequences of changes in farm production systems over the past 30 years or so. So yields increased by 46% and as this has happened the per, use, the, the per hectare use of labour has decreased by 33%. The use of materials and services has increased by 41% and the use of machinery has been fairly flat. So this tells us that Australian farmers haven't relied so much on investing in more machinery to improve productivity. Instead they now use fewer but larger and more sophisticated machines and much more materials and services like seeds, chemicals and fertilisers. And they use much less labour. Some new technologies may offset these trends, but in general, innovation in the future is likely to mean that the trend towards substituting other inputs for labour continues, which in turn will mean a continuation of the trend towards fewer but larger farms. One thing we know about innovation in agriculture is that as a relatively small sector, it often follows trends in the broader economy. So we can expect to see the big changes in digital technology happening elsewhere continue to flow through to agriculture. For example, you can imagine communications technology being used to make better use of contractors, that social media will be used increasingly to share information and knowledge to solve problems quickly, and robots and other smart devices will do some of the things that currently take up a lot of time on farms. Innovation comes from investments in research and development from the public and the private sectors. Public investment tends to be in basic science that underpins new technologies and, and products uh, that the private sector develops. So for example, the internet and GPS technology are the products of public investment in basic science. And things like social media applications and auto steer are the products of private investment to develop these breakthroughs into things that people can use. Looking ahead, it seems that the public contribution to rural R&D isn't likely to grow substantially as budgets are increasingly constrained. This means that private investment in R&D is likely to become more important and will need a greater focus on adapting innovations developed in other countries and in other sectors for use on farm. For government, this means we need to keep on funding basic science and that we don't put too many impediments in the way of private investment in R&D, such as unduly restricting the kinds of products that can be used in Australia or how technologies can be used. It's important to realise that, that this might be quite difficult. Rules about not growing some GM crops or flying drones out of sight or keeping data private all exist because at some level this is what society has chosen. So, so changing them in ways that benefit farmers might not be easy. 
So I've mentioned some of the issues that will drive the outlook for agriculture. There are obviously others, many of which will be covered in the sessions that follow. While for most sectors, farm incomes are as good as they've ever been, we'll need a continued focus on improving productivity to grow our position in world markets in the face of increasing competition. For most crop and livestock products, we aren't expecting prices to rise over the medium term. So increases in profitability will need to come from improved productivity. Innovation across the supply chain will be critical to that, including making the most of new technologies, regardless of where they were developed or what they were originally intended for. Increased use of data, automation, genetics and communications technologies, to name a few, all present opportunities, but they all come with some issues and problems to solve. I hope you enjoy discussing these and other topics today and tomorrow. Uh, thanks and welcome again to Outlook 2017.